Hello, everybody, and welcome here to the Wine with Jimmy channel. Thank you for stopping by. Welcome to a video which I call the producer focus. So I take a specific producer and I will talk in depth about the winery, the people behind the winery, the location, the geology, and also give you some recent vintages as well. So here I'm looking at the Tuscan wine region of Bulgari, and I'm going to be focusing on Gratomaco, which is a very important historical estate in Bulgari. If you do have any comments or questions, please do get in touch, and you can do so by commenting on this video below. Perhaps you have tried Gratomaco, perhaps you collect these wines, what are your favourite vintages, what do you think about their production? please do get in touch. Make sure you click like and subscribe. So there is the wonderful winery of Gratamaco uh, with the background behind it of Casa Vecchia as well, which we're going to talk about their location on the next slide. So let's go through the location to begin with. On the left-hand side is the Consorzio map of the Bulgari region, part of the Marema uh, coastline in Tuscany. Uh, so You'll see all this colourful landscape here, certainly mostly agglomerated towards the north, are all the different producers. And I've highlighted here the Gratamasco estate, which you'll see here is actually this top circle. There's further planted vineyards that you'll find down more into the hills. So it's important to immediately understand that Gratamaco is located in the highest hills of Bulgari. So between Castagneto Carducci and also Bulgari, it's on top of a wooded ridge, which is very typical for the landscape. There's beautiful views that you can actually really sort of soak in when you visit Gratamaco. Now, Claudia Tipa planted two new vineyards, one at higher 200 meters, that's in the circle to the right-hand side, uh, and that's called Casa Vecchia. And then another along the Via Bulgarese. You probably just about see it here, but there are some other lightly coloured blue areas as well towards that grey mass in the centre of the map. So it really is quite an important and actually considered quite a stand uh, alone vineyard and winery because of its location going into the hills, which most Bulgari producers are more towards the plains. Up here, it's more hilly. A little bit of the history to go through. So we must start with Pier Mario Meletti Cavallari, who you'll see in the picture. He acquired the estate in 1977. A wine enthusiast and close friend of Veronelli, Meletti Cavallari revolutionized the estate. Uh, orchards bearing fruits like apples were uprooted in favor of vine rows choosing great varieties which are best suited to the white-based clay soils. Now, planting around this time, we'll find Vermentino, which was not previously planted in the area, Sangiovese and Bordeaux varieties, which remarkably adapted to the estate of Gratamaco. Meletti Cavallari, who you see pictured, was the second entrepreneur to believe in Bulgari's potential after the Marquis in Sisa da Rocchetta. Gratamaco was among the first to consider the Bulgari Hills for wine production, starting in 1982, and bottling the first Bulgari Rosso in 1944, immediately after the regulations were established, therefore becoming an ambassador, pioneer and ambassador for the DOC worldwide. Now, the results of producers like Sasakaya, for example, and Gratamaco have meant that the, the results being so promising has meant that the reputation is very much worldwide and the regulations have now allowed the use. Now, Gratamaco was the first to push well into the heights of Bulgari in the new frontier vineyards of Casa Vecchia where you'll find vineyards which are planted at altitude, surrounded by woods. 
Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history going forward uh, as well. Uh, we're going to talk, talk though, just go on to a really iconic picture, which you will find actually um, both within the Consorzio, if you go to the Consorzio Bogri and Bogri Sasakaya, um, because this is an important picture to show you some of the pioneers behind the Bogri DOC. Now, this picture was taken under the oak tree at Gratamaco. You'll see standing up there quite proud is Pier Mario Meletti Cavallari that we've just been talking about. You'll find sitting on the bench to the right-hand side, Michele Sata, a fantastic wines produced there as well. The Antonoris on the right-hand side, Piero, and then Lodovico Antonori sitting on the bench. And then uh, we also have Niccolo in Cese da Roc Rocchetta, uh, so this is really uh, a picture to give you the birth of the Consorzio. There's the estate from afar. Just to mention that Meletti Cavallari sold the company to Claudio Tipa in 2002. He was an entrepreneur and he followed very much in the footsteps of the gentleman that he purchased it from. The production of the red wines were intensified under his tenure, uh, in line with Grattamaco's dedication to San Giovese, but also Vermentino, becoming one of the most important labels for Grattamaco. In 2004, a careful zoning of the estate identified the site for planting Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc using the Albarello method, so therefore the bush vine method. It was the first time this training method had been adopted in the area of Bulgari, and it's no longer the first, it's no longer the last, rather, there are others as well. So uh, let's talk a little bit here about sort of um, that Vermentino. Here you are. So in 1986, the first Vermentino vineyard was planted in the hills of Bulgari. This was a result of massal selection of the historic native vines, which would uh, yield this wine you'll see in this picture. And they are very much well known for being the pioneer of Vermentino in Bulgari. Vermentino being produced around the Marema coast beforehand, however. So what does it shape up to today? So today we are between Castagneto, Caducci and Bulgari. We mentioned that we're in this kind of ridge, and you'll see it in this picture here, with forests around it. Uh, the estate itself is around 80 hectares, with 34 hectares planted to vineyards and around 5 hectares of olive groves. The vineyards can reach up to 200 metres, like we mentioned, certainly with the new plantation of Casa Vecchia. And it's really a uh, unique position on the hill, surrounded by the slopes that rise from the northern extension of the Metalliferous Hills. And that creates this kind of protected Mediterranean microclimate. The sea breeze makes its way up here, though, uh, and the dry climate is characterized by diurnal temperature variations, which means that acidities are kept quite promisingly here due to those cooler nights. And that elevates the aromatic profile that one can find in Grattamaco. Great varieties, Vermentino, Sangiovese, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot and Petit Verdot. Now I'm going to be take, talking really exclusively uh, in my wines that I tasted, the Grattamaco Bulgari Superiore DOC. But there's also the Albarello that is produced, which is another Bulgari Superiore, made from Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc. They make a Bulgari Rosso, as well as the Vermentino. Production is about 200,000 bottles in total for Gratamaco. What about the grape growing? So Gratamaco grows in vineyards lying at about 100 to 200 metres, planted in soils composed of calcareous sandstone and a mixture of white clay and fossil-rich Fleisch marl. Mediterranean climate and tempered by sea breezes. Uh, it's certainly an estate that believes on a respect for the environment. They have naturally balanced low yield per vine, 
uh, the vineyards being about an average of 25 years old. Hand harvesting and very vigorous selection is adhered to as well. You'll see the olive plantations at the lower elevations. So what about the geology then? Just mention this. So three types of soil, the white clays and limestone marl flesh, that's at about 100 meters, limestone marl beds with a bit of quartzite sandstone, and that's at about 200 meters, and then silty loam and red sands, iron-based red sands uh, in the vineyard, specifically which they name Albarello, which one of their wines come from. So Grattamaco certainly has a high percentage of white clays and flesh along the Bulgari coast. The clays will emerge on the surface and they form a white layer, which is actually visible to the naked eye. This is actually the result of the evaporation of an ancestral saltwater lake, which is a remnant of the ocean's retreat in this area during the likes of the Pliocene and Miocene eras. The disappearance of the saline waters, which occurred more than 5 million years ago, facilitated the formation of these substrata of clays rich in sodium, combined with the disintegration of flesh, basically alternating levels of flesh. Uh, so, white clays and flesh, that create the geological mix that leaves a profound impact on the wine styles. The wines will often uh, develop a distinct flavour. The whites will have freshness and longevity. The reds often get more elegance and finesse. I find often very bright acidities. And tannins can be variable depending on the methodology of Gratamaco because there's quite a lot of maceration. But in a really decent vintage where it's a little bit cooler, the tannins can actually be quite fine and not overtly sweet. The red wine making here is what we're focusing on. So fermentation is in open top vats with no temperature control. And the wine is given regular gentle manual punch downs, making really possibility of a lengthy maceration. They like to talk about the fact that this maceration is actually long, but it's actually quite gentle and slow. So the skin contact occurs throughout the wine fermentation, of course, but then continues on the skins post-fermentation for an indefinite amount of time. And that is determined really by continual tasting of that wine. This is more famous for the Cabernet Sauvignon and not so uh, frequent for the likes of the Sangiovese or the Merlot. The time on skins will be determined by tasting and will be certainly factored by the vintage, for example, and the quality of those skins. Malolactic conversion takes place in French oak barriques and barrels and is kept separate for all of the different varieties. And generally, the Finnish wine will spend around 18 months today in small oak barrels, with around a third of it being new and two thirds being one to two year old fill barrels. So I was lucky enough to be a part of a vertical tasting, tasting wines from 1991 to 2021, spanning three decades, 30 years. So I'm going to talk through these vintages, talking about the youngest first. So the youngest first is the 2021. So this is classified as a Bulgari Superiore, and it has the typical blend of 65% Cabernet Sauvignon, 20% Merlot, and 15% Sangiovese, hitting alcohols of around 14.5. I love the 2021s of Bulgari. I find them very fragrant, um, drinkable, uh, so not overtly powerful, but drinkable, but they're exceptionally well-made wines. Now, following a mild winter and normal precipitation levels, which prompted an early bud break, the onset of spring saw a lack of rainfall coupled with sudden temperature drop. And then, in fact, they had a frost on the Bulgari plains on the 8th of April, but Gratamaco being on the hills was actually spared from the frost. 
from mid-April to the first two weeks of May, the rain came with some humidity, but it gave vital water supplies to the vines, important for the very hot and dry summer to come. The harvest was August the 25th, continuing actually quite late until September the 28th. I love this wine for having a deep ruby colour, intense with a kind of red element to it, kirsch mixed in with blackberries and cassis. I like the sweetness of the fruits, quite powerful. Good mouthfeel, sweet tannin, but grainy at the same time with vibrant acidity and also a lift of spice that comes through with the alcohol. Dark, powerful, but focused with a good bright acidity behind it, laden in black fruit on the palate, cigar tobacco, and a little bit of that new oak sitting quite heavily on the wine for now. Uh, the winemaker Luca, I'll mention him a little bit at the end of the presentation, really aligns the 21 with the 2019 and also the 2016. And that brings me on to the 2016, the same blend of grape vines. This is the first vintage to add grapes from the Casa Vecchia vineyard, the higher altitude planted site, uh, which certainly adds a lot of freshness. You'll find the higher elevation fruit, it's slower ripening with fresher, more mineral tannin and then bright acidity. It now accounts, the Casa Vecchia, for about 50% of the wine, as it's about a 10 hectare site. So it's certainly a wine uh, that is a major focus since 2016 in the Gratamaco wines. The season started off fairly dry. Temperatures were not severe, and there was good bud break and early flowering. May and June had little rainfall, but temperatures were actually quite low, uh, so were quite high, above average, particularly in the latter third of the month and into the arrival of summer. Now, there was lots of sunlight in this vintage, plenty of strong UV light, so leaf pulling was not adopted. The leaves were um, left on the vine to provide good shading, which ends up sort of giving a bit more of a balance to a vintage, which is going to be quite intense. July and August continued hot. There was a little bit of rainfall in late July, and that meant the, the vines could keep going. They didn't go through blocking. They, it kind of gave them a little bit of a respite. And the same again in late August which was very good for the uh, late, uh, sorry, the early ripening varieties like Merlot, for example. Harvest started on the 25th of August, finished on the 30th of September, just a little bit later than the 2021. There were rains in mid-September, though, to the Cabernet Sauvignon in the Casa Vecchia vineyard. That extended its ripening period and it improved the quality of the skins and the seeds, as well as the juice yield, as you would expect. Um, there's actually quite a lot of freshness due to this impact. So yes, these higher altitude vineyards, you really get a great focus in the wines, a brightness, which is lovely. I found dark black fruit, red plum, touch of smoke, spice, and a licorice and chocolate edge to this wine. Full, dense, laden with sweet black fruit, I love that kind of kirschy plummy note uh, and a real wonderful sweetness on the palate with a fine grainy tannin overlaying some of the sweeter structure. Great acidity, lovely concentration. I just think it lacks tertiary at this moment, just needs a little bit more time to develop even more complexity. The 2012 vintage is next with the same grape mix, but a drop in alcohol towards 14%. Now this year actually started quite strangely. It was fairly wet, cold, and there in fact were snowfalls along the hilly mountainous areas in February, which is a rather rarity for the area. Moderate spring rains then scattered over April and May, and that gave you kind of textbook flowering and fruit set. The summer was hot and dry. Often you get quite 
above average warm temperatures. But then we have rains intermittently in August and September, which then also dropped the temperatures and enabled the vines to continue its ripening process without going through too much stress. Uh, Merlot was ready fairly early in late August uh, with very good acidity and polyphenols. And early September saw more rainfall, but the Tramontana wind brought the dry weather to chase away any humidity. We find that uh, a bit of rain came on the 19th of September and Cabernet was harvested between the 23rd of September and the 3rd of October. So later uh, for the Cabernet fruit than the 16 and the 21. The wine certainly shows uh, interesting character. So very fresh, more salinity, more minerality here with dark fruit, spice, chocolate and licorice. I love the aromatic touch, mouth coating sweet fruit, lovely strike between the brightness and the tannin, and it's laden in lovely sweet spices and black pepper. Uh, I found this actually out of the whole lineup, the most complete, integrated and rounded, a real wonderful vintage shining through there in the 2012. The 2009 comes next. So the same grape mix, same alcohol as the 2016. Winter and spring here were cool and rainy with normal bud break. May was dry, but the rains came again in June, but it had no impact on flowering or fruit, fruit set, although it may have been a little bit minor. Summer was sunny, almost completely dry with above average heat, which meant that Merlot and Sangiovese raced along to ripeness. Uh, they were brought in in late August, and then Cabernet Sauvignon and other late ripeners were given a bit of respite by mid-September rainfalls. Uh, eventually, uh, Cabernet was harvested in mid-October, so fairly late again. Um, I love this in terms of its story behind it, but I do find that it had a slightly volatile compound to it. So almost a kind of charred element, a um, bit of elevated volatility, smoky, medicinal, ashy, um, forward alcohol, darker fruit, menthol and eucalypt, a little bit disjointed for 2009 for me personally. 2008 comes next. Once again, same grape mix and same alcohol. A cold, rainy winter started the 2008 season, but bud break occurred on schedule. Spring rains during flowering delayed the fruit set and actually ended up reducing the fruit crop with damage to the vines such as couleur. Then summer came with intense heat, with almost no rainfall throughout September. But... There was good amounts of heat, cold nights in September. And then in mid-September, the Tramontana wind blew through and in fact lowered the temperatures. So Sangiovese and then crossing into late ripening Cabernet Sauvignon completed their ripening process with an aromatic profile. Deep in garnet color, deep concentration, black fruited by the core, quite that touch of iron note to it. And in fact, Grata Maco, uh, it really stems from meaning um, iron. And that's where your, um, your Maco part comes from. So you'll often find a, a slightly sort of iron oxidized, savory element to these wines. Certainly it showed here in the 2008, it was meaty, irony, uh, kind of that rare meat character. Not as aromatic as the 2006 to come, but powerfully tannic, mouth coating and present with quite a lot of chewy, ripe tannin behind it. Um, the winemaker Luca states this as one of the most underrated and uh, un undervalued vintages. The 2006 comes next. Now, I mentioned Luca earlier. I'm just going to jump to Luca just here. He is the gentleman on the right hand side. So he is the chief winemaker for Colle Massari Estates, which today 
is the owner of Gratamaco. Um, his background is that his family is very much a long family tradition of grape growing and winemaking. He graduated from the University of Pisa with a Bachelor's of Science degree in Enology and Viticulture. He then worked in other wineries in Italy, overseas in New Zealand and also Chile. And he joined uh, the Colle Massari team in 2003 at the age of 26 as an assistant winemaker. He leads the teams in both Bulgari, Montalcino and Montacuccio. And he oversees all across the Colle Massari, Gratarmaco, Poggio do Sotto and San Giorgio as well. So I brought him in here for this part because we are going to talk about um, in the lineup that I'm presenting, the first uh, that is actually made by him. So the ones previously all made by him, but this is the first of the lineup because he joined in 2003. So this was his third vintage in 2006. The same grape mix, but a lower alcohol at 13.5. It was the last of uh, last vintage of this number before they start to go into the 14s and 14.5. Now, 2006 was fairly normal generally. Uh, severe and rainy winter, but the spring was warm, sunny, and with that water that came in winter and the decent start to spring, vine growth was very good. Flowering was fairly um, consistent and that was between late May and early June. A little bit of smatterings of rain in June and July, but excellent uh, flowering and fruit set. Lack of rain in August, but still the raison color change was very successful. No excessive temperatures, uh, so fairly decent aromatic profiles generally here. And we had an early September crop for Merlot, they were very ripe, uh, sound, healthy, with good concentrations. Loads of rain then comes in middle of September on the 15th and 16th of September, which kind of slows down the Cabernet. But then after a few days, Cabernet starts to pick up again. And all of this gives a, a freshness to the Cabernet fruit. Um, the rains were classified by Luca as very important. Uh, he pulled the leaves off the canopy at this time to enable better UV ripening in those days that immediately preceded uh, following, those, uh, um, uh, following those rains. So this is deep garnet with a darker fruit core, expecting things like blackberry, licorice. It's spiced laden with tobacco and cigar, much more sort of Bordeaux aged like. Fine and drying mouth coating tannin vibrant sort of salinity, sapidity throughout with a fresher black fruit on the palate, not dried, but spice laden, cedary, resinous in places with a meaty, leathero, uh, leathery tobacco touch, long and structured, but still could do with a little more time. We then go into our last decade, the 1995. So this predates Luca as the winemaker and therefore the winemaker is Pierre Mario Maletti Cavallari, who we mentioned earlier. Now, this is the same blend again, but once again, a lower alcohol of 12.5%. Uh, the late bud break here started the 1995 growing season, which also impacted flowering as well. We had chilly weather in early summer, but then followed by very high temperatures throughout early August. And then September was intermittently sunny with rains and cooler conditions uh, and decent wine was produced as a result of this. The 1995 vintage was actually the first vintage that Gratamaco introduced Merlot into the blend replacing a portion of the Sangiovese and Cabernet Sauvignon also increased its importance. Now, pre-1995, it was pretty much a Cabernet Sauvignon and Sangiovese blend half and half. So you can see that Cabernet Sauvignon has increased a little. Uh, Sangiovese has dropped quite significantly. Now, 
We have Cabernet Sauvignon being fermented in oak vats, Sangiovese and Merlot in concrete and steel. And this wine was kind of a medium to pale tawny. The Merlot element are from fairly young vines. So there isn't a huge concentration on this wine. It's more spice and aromatic, meaty, dried red fruit, almond, marzipan, sweeter mouthful, a nice sweet mouthful actually, which the Merlot gives, but delicate on the palate with drying residual tannin on the roof of the mouth. Good acidity, but a wine that's certainly just in its drinking phase, at the end of its drinking phase. I found it fairly sort of iron and savoury and soya saucy also on a later smell. And then we come to the Gratamaco 1991, which predates the creation of the Consorzio and the DOC. So this is classified as a vino do tavola. The Merlot was not included. Uh, as we mentioned, that was introduced in 1995. So this is half amounts of Cabernet Sauvignon and Sangiovese. Now, the winemaker was Pierre Mario again, and Pierre Mario uh, mentions that uh, the wines of the 90s, certainly this 1991, were much more imminently drinkable. The 91 season was satisfactory to begin with. Spring was cool, but rainy, and flowering was good and kind of on the money. Summer was dry, with some days really quite intense with high temperatures, but some dropping low. So it's kind of a roller coaster of a year. The most intense period of harvesting occurred in September. Grapes were quite healthy. Cabernet was fermented in oak vats, Sangiovese in steel and concrete, with only 12 months aging in barrique. Deep tawny with dried red fruits, leather, black truffle with a salinity to it, black olive and soya sauce. The mako element, the iron edge really came through here, uh, but the drying tannin is quite softened and it's quite meaty and savoury. Good freshness, but lots of development here, as you would expect. Touch of coffee and spice here too, and almost a smoky sort of bake, bacon edge, a meatiness that comes through on that finish. So um, just another mention here on a wine called the Bulgari Vermentino, uh, well worth seeking out because it's a lovely wine. This is the oldest Vermentino vines in Bulgari, 40 years of history almost, and the vines are located around 100 metres on a natural terrace facing the sea. The soil here is kind of a white saline clay mixed with marley limestone flesh. You'll get distinct minerality on this wine. Uh, some herbal notes, often a little hint of things like basil or sage, floral notes, and even a little bit of that kind of broom characteristic. One third is in barrique, two thirds is in steel, and it's aged for six months with lees aging, fine lees aging with stirring. And that's where you tend to get a nice roundness, sort of supporting the kind of orchard fruit to peach characteristic of this wine. Well, thank you very much for joining me on this journey, looking at the key producer of, or a key producer of Bogri Gratamaco. Once again, if you do have any comments, any questions, please do get in touch. It'd be great to hear from you. Who would you like to see me present next for Bogri? Have you tried these wines of Gratamaco? What do you think about the Bianco, the white uh, that you see here from Vermentino? What are your favourite vintages? Perhaps one of the ones I haven't mentioned or have not had the opportunity of tasting. Please do get in touch, share your information, and let's make a community of wine together. And if you do find yourself in the UK, make sure you come and say hi for a class, glass, or bottle. I've been Jimmy. Ciao.